If you will turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 39. Genesis, chapter 39. Hallelujah. And I just want to comfort you this morning. I know that I am very pregnant. <laughs> I am two weeks away from having this baby. And Sean said if I have the baby up here, that he's got my back. Because he's a nurse. <laughs> so he's going to take care of it. I said it would be great if I said, Jesus, let the river of God flow and carry it. <laughs> that would be priceless, right? But look, I asked Pastor Matt, he asked me if I would come and preach, and he said, I know it's going to be two weeks away. I said, I will come if I do not have this baby. My husband said, well, that's probably not a great idea. I said, I want to do it anyway. <laughs> and I want to tell Selah that she was here when I got to minister two weeks away from having her. Hallelujah. So the title of my message this morning is No Means No. No means no. Say it with me. No means no. Okay? Y'all ever hear that from your parents a lot? When you were growing I know my parents said it a lot. Look, no means no. Well, why? No means no. No just means no. You just got to trust me. You just got to listen to me. No means no. Hallelujah. <laughs> Genesis 39, verse 7. And it came to pass. After these things, that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. And she said, lie with me. That was a trap. That was a setup. That word lie means come rest with me. Come sleep with me. Come settle down with me. The enemy was trying to set this man of God up. To come rest in his plan rather than God's plan. Genesis 39, 8 said, what was his response? But he refused. Hallelujah. Thank God for those of us that refuse the lies and the tactics of the enemy. It said he did. That word refuse means that he did not show. He showed an unwillingness to comply. He denied her advances. He declined it. He stood fast. He rejected it. And he disapproved of her advances. I want to say this. We should be people of God that disapprove of any other way but God's way. And when we don't understand God's way, we should ask him to give us and settle in our hearts. God, I might not understand why you don't agree with this, but I want to fall in line with what you agree with. Yeah. I want to fall in line with your truth. I want to fall in line with your way. But we have to be people that when we see the advance of the enemy coming our way, I decline that. I disapprove of that. God said that was not for me. God said that was not something I should do or say or go or be. So I am going to stand and I'm going to disapprove of that thing. I'm coming in line with God Amen. and what God says. So he refused her advances. And said unto the master's wife, Behold, my master trusts me with all that is in, with, in me within the house. The, our master has trusted us with everything that is in his house. Yeah. Do you hear what I'm saying to you this morning? Jesus died to give you peace. He's trusting you to cultivate that peace. Jesus died to give you forgiveness. He's trusting you to cultivate that forgiveness. Yeah. Jesus died to give you freedom. And he's trusting you and committing to you to, to trust you to cultivate that forgiveness. To believe, God, you have forgiven me. You have trusted me with this. I'm not going to waste my birthright. I'm not going to waste it away on the lies and schemes of the enemy. And go, I am going to stand. I am going to refuse the advances of the enemy. I will not make my bed with the enemy. I will not lie 
down with the lies of the enemy. I will not rest there. That word sleep means that you become unaware. You don't even know what's going on anymore. My dad sang that song about being awake. We got to wake up, church. Yeah. We've got to wake up. There is a battle going on. Yes, there is. And there's a battle of good and evil. Yeah, like and now these days we're calling evil good and good evil. Yeah. So we as the body of Christ have to be completely awake and aware to our surroundings and what's going on. And the Bible says, and he has committed, he has committed, he has entrusted all that he has in my hand. And there is none greater in the house than I. Neither has he kept back anything from me but you. Because you are his wife. How then can I do such great wickedness and sin against God? I thought about this because sometimes we sin and we fall short and we don't recognize that it was against God. Yes. David said this in Psalms 51. He said, create in me a clean heart. And renew a right spirit within me. But then he later on in the verses he said against you and you only God have I sinned. When we fall short, when we mess up, it's yes it can be at odds against our brother or sister or and there's consequences. But in the end we have to recognize it's against God and God only that we have sinned. And that's what Joseph recognized. Joseph was, he was saying, he was even speaking to the advances of the enemy, saying, no, I'm not going to submit under this wickedness. Yeah. I'm not going to submit under the tactic of the enemy. I'm not going to allow you to lie to me that this is a good idea. I'm not going to allow you to come in and take a foothold in my life. I am going to recognize I will not sin against my God. I will stand fast. And it said, it came to pass as she spoke to Joseph. I want y'all to get this. Day by day. The enemy doesn't let up. He don't let up. <laughs> He don't give up. He's not here to quit. The moment that you said yes to Jesus, there was a bullseye upon your back. The moment you said yes to Jesus and started praying over your children, there is a bullseye on their back. And our job is to recognize the voice of God and the voice of the enemy. And then we're supposed to detect who, who's speaking and submit under the voice of God. And the only way that you can do that is being in the word of God. The only way you can do that is sit under anointed preaching. The only way you can do that is spend time in the presence of God to, to hear his voice. See, he doesn't speak to me the same way that he speaks to Jeff. He doesn't speak to me the same way he speaks to Naya. He, the, the voice of God, he speaks to the person according to where they're at. Amen. He does. Amen. Now, it's always in the word of God. You can line up what he says with scripture. And if it's not in scripture, it's not God. That's right. Let me say that again. That's right. If what you are hearing is not in the word of God and witnessed by two or three witnesses in the word of God, it is not the truth. It is not the truth. But how do I learn that? I learn that by studying. I learn that by listening. I learn that by sitting with God. I'm trying to teach y'all something this morning. That God has been teaching me. That no means no. God, there's not, there's not a gray area with God. And the reason why God does that is because God is a God of life. He's the giver of life. He wants you to have life and life more abundantly. So he leaves us examples in the Bible that will tell us, look, I have this life and this plan for you, but the enemy is going to try to ambush 
you. You hear what I'm saying this morning? I have it. I, I am advancing you in the kingdom of God. And that's my proposition this morning. There's God's advancement, but the enemy's ambush. Let me say that to you again. There's God's advancement. He's trying to progress you forward. He doesn't want you to go backward. But the enemy has an ambush, an attack against you and your soul and your family. Amen. That word ambush means it's a surprise. It's hidden. It was unsuspected. It was lying in wait for your life. No, hear me. This is about your soul. Your soul is eternal. The enemy is lying in wait to set you up. He's the master of the setup. And our job is to see it. So we see time and time again in the life of Joseph that God is advancing Joseph forward in the things of God. But time and time again, here comes a snare, an ambush, the enemy to hinder and stop and dismantle what God is doing. But I'm going to tell you this. There is nothing that can stop the plan of God in your life. There is nothing that can stop God from advancing you and to bringing it to pass as long as you have confidence and trust and hope in him. You stay the course. You keep the faith. You keep on pressing. I mean, even when you fall down, you get back up and you believe God's promises and you trust in the blood of Jesus. Even when you make a mistake, you get back up and you trust in God and you believe I am blameless because of the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ. You, you trust in his righteousness as a substitute for your righteousness because our righteousness is as filthy rags. But he has made you righteous by the blood of the Lamb. So the, another tactic of the enemy is to get you to believe that you are not right with God and you might as well quit. But that's a lie. That's right. Come on. It's, it's a tactic. It's an ambush. We've got to know the voice and character of God. Amen. And that's what actually my lovely drawing <laughs> up here. So this ring around it is the blood of Jesus. And within the framework of the blood of Jesus, Jesus is, and if I'm out of breath and I sound out of breath, it's because I am. Y'all carry this belly and y'all find out. He is righteous. He's powerful. He's forgiving. He's comforter. He's peace. He's good. He's loving. He's kind. He's caring. He's giving. He's faithful. He is strong. He is wise. He is gracious. He is eternal. He is sovereign and merciful and compassionate and patient. He is the one who makes all things new. You need something new this morning? You need yeah. to be renewed this morning? You need something to turn around this morning? He makes all things new. He is the shepherd. He is your refuge. You need healing this morning. He is my healer this morning. He is your ever-present helper. Ever-present. He does not leave you. He does not forsake you. He doesn't slumber nor sleep. He is always there. Always there. He is the one who saves. And our anchor, our support. I know my anchor is, listen, y'all. I'm not an artist, okay? But my anchor, my support, my stability, the one who steadies me and settles me, my anchor is within the framework of Calvary and who he is. So on the outside, we have all these things, these tactics coming against him. We have the world. We have our own flesh. We have our own emotions. We have the devil. We have all these things that are traps that are coming against us. But the blood of Jesus remains the same. And as we trust in him, as we anchor our faith right here in who he is, and we don't waver from that, there's a steadiness in the Christian's walk. There's a, there's a settling in the Christian's walk. I, Micah sang it beautifully this morning. 
I am yours. Yeah. I, that is who I am. I am righteous. I am forgiven. Yeah. He is my healer. I believe for my healing. He is my peace. When there is no peace at all. He is my joy when I shouldn't have joy. He is merciful when, when I need mercy. Like, you gotta, we gotta get this church. We gotta get who he is. Because if we don't, James says that we will be tossed to and fro in the tumult of life. Of the of the of the um, storm, that's what the word I'm looking for. Storm of life. Yeah. Look, every day, it's a day by day. Day by day. Here come the, the ambush of the enemy. And it said that Joseph hearkened, listened not, heard not. He paid no attention to the ambush of the enemy. We got to learn something, church. I don't know about you, but I have fallen. I have fallen short. I have fallen into a place where I begin to believe yeah. the lie of the enemy. I be begin to fall under the lie of the enemy and the oppression of the enemy that tells me a God is not advancing me. To tell me that um, God's done with me and to hang. I mean, I don't know. Does anybody else hear that? Does anybody else say God's done with you? That's a wrap. You might as well hang it up now. You might as well give up now. You're never going to see your children come out of that. You're never going to see that job come. You're never going to. So the lies and tactics of the enemy come. But it said, Joseph, hearken not. He listened not. He had one voice he was trying to hear. And, that, and, and he went through a lot. And we're going to go through it quickly. But he listened not to the voice of the enemy. Because he knew yeah. in his spirit and in his heart, oh, God had a plan for me. God has a purpose for me. I might not see it right now. And it might look really bad right now. But God, he is good. He's the one who makes all things new. He makes it all new and he's going to do it. Yes, Hallelujah. In the setting of Joseph's life, we see this. We see Joseph, Genesis 37, 3, please. Now Israel, who was Jacob, Jacob and Rebekah had Joseph. So God, God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, then Joseph. And we see that Jesus would come from the bloodline of Joseph. So Joseph's position in Christ was super important because out of his bloodline was going to come Jesus. God had a great plan for Joseph. And it says, Genesis 37, 3, Now Israel, who was Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his children because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. That coat of many colors represents your birthright in Christ. You have a right, a birthright as a child of God to know who you are. Yes. You have a birthright to say, I am right before God. It is your right as a child of God. You have a birthright to say, I am free and forgiven. You have a birthright to say, my children are coming yes. with me. Yes. You have a birthright. It is your right because of the blood of Jesus to say, I am healed. It is your birthright. And he was clothed in this birthright. Yes. And look, when you start walking in the power of God, when you start believing actually who you are in Christ and the anointing of God rests upon your life, the enemy is not going to stop. He's not going to. And it says this. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all these the brethren, what they do? They hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. There's going to be those when God is using you in a special way that don't appreciate what God is doing in your life. So get ready. 
There's going to be those that become jealous of what God is doing in your life. Or maybe they don't understand it just based off of ignorance. And they begin to come against what God is doing in your life. But I want to remind you of this truth. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers of darkness and wicked rulers of the air. We don't look at the faces. Understand what you're fighting against. You're fighting against the power of darkness and the ambush of the enemy that could use other people's weaknesses to get you off track. You hear what I'm saying? It could be your spouse. It could be your mom. It could be your dad. It could be it could be anybody. Or it just could be the lies of the enemy. Or it could be your own insecurity. It could be your own flesh that's trying to get you off track. But God said we wrestle not against flesh and blood. There is a war between darkness and evil. We, we have to understand the war that's going on between Satan and God. And we have to understand that we don't want to listen to the lie, but we want to take the lie to the truth so that the truth exposes the lie. Yeah. Right. Bring the lie to the truth so the truth can shed light on the lie. And the enemy would use Joseph's brothers to try to stop the plan of God in his life. But God does not waste anything. Right. You hear what I'm saying to you? God doesn't waste even our mistakes. Right. He is constantly teaching us. He is constantly developing us. He is constantly, I mean, each week I got a text message on this app on my phone that told me what was developing in my womb. God can send us messages that tell us, hey, I am preparing you for this upcoming event. I am preparing you to do this with you. I am preparing you for the next season. He doesn't even always tell you what's going to happen. Amen. But he, he said, I am developing you. Yeah. I am making you into something that you could not make yourself into. As long as you trust me, as long as you believe me, as long as you anchor your hope in me, as long as you look to me, the Spirit of God will come and begin to change and develop your heart and give you and equip you for whatever is to come. But we have to continue to trust Him. And Joseph was being prepared for to become second in command in the palace. But Joseph did not know that he was going to be second in command in Pharaoh's palace. You don't know. It's not for us to know the plan that God has for us. That's why it's called faith. Amen. And faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of God. Yes. So we have to continue to develop our relationship with the Lord in the word of God, and he will begin to develop our character as we trust him he will begin to develop and strengthen and build our faith as we continue to walk this out but the enemy is trying to penetrate God's plan as God prepares you so every step forward you take in advancing and refusing and saying no means no the enemy is trying to penetrate that plan so that you go backwards. So that the enemy can draw you back in. It said that Potiphar's wife was constantly nagging him. Jeff says I nag him all the time. <laughs> Not like that though. <laughs> but she was constantly watching and lurking. Trying to set him up. But you know what's crazy is I read that Potiphar's wife, the scholars say, she was one of the most virtuous women in the kingdom. But something about Joseph got her going. The enemy knows exactly how to set us up and will get, will get us going. And Potiphar's wife didn't have the understanding nor the wisdom nor the discernment to say, Wait, hold up. <laughs> Amen. That, that's a lie. That's a tactic. That is not what I want. 
She just was ruled by her own desires and her own longings and, and her own lasciviousness. That means without boundaries. You had no boundaries. She had no boundaries. And listen, let me tell you something. When the anointing of God begins to flow in your life, other people will be attracted to the anointing. Yeah. They're not attracted. Like, I hate to say it like this, but if I could be blunt, they're really not attracted to you. They're attracted to the presence of God in your life. And they don't, they don't recognize that it's the presence of God in your life. And then the enemy will use them to destroy what God is trying to do in your life. And he will, he will set it up to bring, have them bring things to you and do all these things. I mean, all of a sudden they'll be on your phone and this, that, and the other. It's a setup. You hear what I'm saying? It's a setup from hell. They're being used. And you know what? That's why you can't even look at them crooked because they don't even know they're being used. But you got to know who you serve. <laughs> You got to know who you are. Yeah. Even in the workplace, you're discouraged. You're, it's, the enemy's coming in to bring confusion. God is not the author of confusion. Yeah. He's the author of peace. Yes. That's right. Right. He's not going to bring tumult and confusion. That's right. He's going to bring peace that you can rest in it. It could be anywhere. It could be anything. The enemy can use your children. To start getting you all flustered and get you all off track. God said, no, I have a plan. I have a purpose. I'm preparing you for the palace. You got to get ready, though. I'm going to use your circumstances as tools. To, so God either orchestrates it or he allows it. Yeah. Hear what I'm saying to you? God either orchestrates it or allows it. But I do want to say this. God is not the author of evil. I hear a lot, I get this a lot. The question is, why does God allow good things to happen to bad people? I mean, I mean, bad things to happen to good people, excuse me. Bad things to happen to good people. Well, Joseph was a godly man. And we see time after time him being thrown into the pit. He got sold into slavery. He got sold to Potiphar's house. Then he got thrown in the prison, and then he got promoted to the palace. And I'm sure Joseph could have been like, you know what? Just like Job's wife, why don't you just curse God and die? Why don't I just quit? Because all these bad things keep happening to me. Let me say this. We live in a fallen world. It, the Bible says this, that even creation groans. After the coming of the Lord. Because of sin. Entering in. In the garden. We now deal. With a fallen people. That's right. And we deal with people. That do not know God. Yeah. And we deal with circumstances. And situations. That happen. Even Job lost his house. He lost his cattle. He lost his children. He lost everything. And we can look at that. And say God. Why do you allow such bad things to happen to such a godly man? But Job trusted in the Lord. He said, I know that my Redeemer lives. And though even these things have happened to me, I will trust him. Even covered in boils, I'm going to trust him. And God restored him a hundredfold what he had lost. Because his faith, his faith. His faith in him. Yes. Hallelujah. So I want to say, our faith is what anchors us. The Bible says, Hebrews 6, 19, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. I want to, Naya and I have been talking about this a lot lately, between the spirit and the soul and the body. Which hope we have to anchor the what? The soul, both sure and steadfast, and which have entered in that which is behind the veil. That word anchor means keeps you grounded, keeps you steady, holds you what? Still. An anchor keeps you grounded, keeps you steady, holds you still. 
And it says this anger is sure. It's certain. It's safe. Yeah. It's steadfast. Yeah, it's no. stable. It's firm. And it's even forceful. I mean, it's not going to let you go. Yeah. You hear what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. But I'm going to say this. When you get saved, the spirit, spirit of God enters in your spirit and gives you a what? A new heart and a new mind and a new spirit. But then you have a soul. Yep. And within the framework of your soul is emotions. Right. Woo! Our emotions can be all over the place, right, Jeff? He lives with a, pre he lives with a pregnant woman right now. <laughs> our emotions can be what? All over the place. Our agendas. Right. You got your own agenda for your life, right? I thought I was going to do this, and I was going to do that, and I was going to be this, and I was going to be that, and I was going to go here, and I was going to go there. I was going to marry this person, and I was going to do that. And I had all these agendas and all these plans and all these ideas for my life. My own intellect, the way I think, the way I listen to how other people think. My feelings, my mindset, my desires, my longings is all within your soul. So he says, I'm going to be an anchor. He said, doesn't say I'm going to be an anchor to your spirit. Because your spirit is now the spirit of God. That's right. He said, I'm going to be an anchor to your soul. Uh -huh. yeah. Because I know that your mind is going to chase after things it shouldn't. I know that your emotions are going to long after things that it shouldn't. I know you're going to get your own idea of what you shall become and what you should be doing even in the church house. I mean, y'all think I should play the piano and not Naya, right? <laughs> yeah, right. But no, for real. We come in the church, we think we can do better, something better than everybody else. We go into our job, we think we can do something better than everybody else. We were in our house and we think we are the better mama. Than, or daddy than everybody else. No, really though. God got to change some things in the soul. Yeah. <laughs> and, and your soul is your heart. God's got to change our hearts. Yeah. God's got to change the way we look at things. Yeah. God's got to change the way we think about things. Yeah. God's got to change your desires. You know how when your appetite, I don't know about you, but being pregnant, my appetite has changed. Okay? Well, when we get saved... Your appetite needs to change. Yeah. Our appetite needs to change. See, God has now impregnated you with the Spirit of God. Yeah. Okay? And now your appetite has to change yeah. to a healthier appetite yeah. to the things of God. Desire the things of God and say, I don't understand how I'm going to do that. It just, it's there every day. It's there every day. My appetite for that thing is there every day. You ask the Holy Spirit, God, I need you to change my appetite. Yeah. I need you to change my desires. I need you to change the way I look at brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. Or God, change the way I think about you. I think about you as a harsh taskmaster. I think about you as this God that's shut up there just ruling and doesn't love me. Come on, these are things, I don't know about you, but these are things I thought about. God, why are you allowing this to happen to me? Why I got to move to Meridian, Mississippi? Why, why I have to leave New Jersey? Why, why do I have to be the one that, that you wake up in the middle of the night and has got to pray? No, nobody ever feels that way. <laughs> Why do I have to travel? Why do I have to stay at this job? This job is just a bunch of headache. I've been there. And I don't know how many times Holy Ghost said stay. Stay. I'm so sick of this job. Stay. Because God was doing something in me. And I would see. I would see God move where I was. And it would be encouraging Right? And that's what was happening with Joseph. Joseph was thrown into the pit by his brothers. As soon as his brothers seen him coming, they said, let's kill him. His brothers. But that's what the enemy is saying. Here comes Joseph. 
Here comes Micah. Here comes Jennifer. Here comes Brennan. Let's destroy them. Here they come. Here comes Pam. Back at the altar. Let's get her. Here comes Michelle. Advancing for the kingdom of God. Here comes Wade speaking for the glory of God. Let's get him. And they want to, and, he, and his brothers. So they went to rob the enemies, their enemies' characters to rob, to kill, and to destroy. And they went and they threw them in a pit. And, the, and it said in the pit it had no water. The job of the enemy is to get you to not have the flow of the Holy Ghost. The job of the enemy is to get you to not be saturated in the presence of God. The job of the enemy is to get you into a position where there is no water. But the Bible says that Jesus is a well of living water. That he is a well of living water. It says, spring up a well within my soul. I don't care if you're in the pit. Begin to worship him in the pit. I'm sure, I don't know what Joseph's thought process was down there. But I know I could be in a pit and begin to sing, spring up a well within my soul. Spring up a well and make me whole. Spring up a well and give to me. This life, what abundantly. Well, my life don't look abundant right now. Sing it again. (laughs) Spring up a well within my soul. Because you know what God does? God doesn't always take you immediately out of the pit. He makes you content in the pit. Because his spirit's there with you. You don't like it right now? That's okay. Sing to the Lord. Begin to express your love for him. Your gratitude, a grateful heart. Naya's mom used to say, a grateful heart will take you all the way to heaven. Why? Because when you begin to thank the Lord for who he is, it doesn't matter where you're at or what you're doing. It doesn't matter what you're facing anymore. Faith arises in your soul and the enemy has to be scared. That's what submitting yourself to the Lord looks like. I don't understand it, Lord. I don't know why I'm here, Lord. I don't know why my husband has left me and my children have walked away. I don't know why I lost my job. I don't know why I'm sick, but I'm here, Lord. Spring up a well within my soul. Spring up a well and make me whole. Whole in my circumstance. Whole in my brokenness. Whole in my trial. Whole in my pain and my grief and my sorrow. Whole where I have unforgiveness. Whole. God made me whole in you even in the pit. And you know what? The advancement of God isn't always materialistic. Now look, I'm all about the Lord blessing us. I am and I believe he does. But God is advancing you in your heart towards him. He is maturing you in your faith. He is developing you in your faith. And in the process, he uses the pit. He uses He uses being sold. He uses these things in Joseph's life. Psalms 5, 4 says this. For thou art not a God that takes pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. My question to you was, does God, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? I want you to remember this scripture when you feel that way. My, for thou art not a God that takes what? Pleasure. He's not pleased nor delighted when wickedness comes upon you. When evil befalls you. He's not pleased with that. But he's, he uses it as a tool to teach. To teach. Y'all teach your children, right? We want to teach our children. Sometimes we got to sit them down and have a hard conversation with them. Sometimes we got to take their telephones. Sometimes we got to ground them. Sometimes we got to spank them. You don't believe in spanking, the Bible says, spare the rod, spoil the child. Take that up with Jesus. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> There's different modes of communication that God has with his children, that we have with our children. And the Bible says that he takes no pleasure in evil. And I want to say this too. James 
1 13 says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. That's right. For God cannot tempt you with evil. That's right. Neither tempteth he any man. That means that he does not entice you to go the wrong way. He does not attract you by the host of your desires. It says this, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away with his own lust and then enticed. It says, then when he has lusted after, when he has longed after, when he has craved after it, when he has urged that direction, that lust has conceived, that becomes, you become impregnated with that lust. And the lust brings forth sin, and sin brings forth death. The lust brings forth sin, and sin brings forth death. That means when you see it, when you hear it, there it is. That's the moment you're supposed to deal with it. The moment the lie comes, the moment the enticement comes, the moment you hear the wrong thing, you're supposed to recognize it, detect it, refuse it, deny it. I mean, I, I gave this gave this example before. We're real good at hitting the decline button on our phone when we don't want to talk to somebody. Better learn how to deal with the enemy. Decline. Amen. I ain't listening to that today. I'm hearkening not unto that voice today. Decline. Amen. Uh, uh you know them them callers. That Jeff always messes with them callers that call, the spam callers. He likes to mess with them. But you know what is wise? Decline every voice of the enemy. Yeah. Every spam call you get, you decline. Every spam call you get, you refuse it. Yeah. Every spam call you get from the enemy, you recognize that is not for me. And not me in my house. And I will not be enticed. I will not conceive or birth this lust that is coming against me, but I will submit myself unto God. And look, it doesn't have to be. When we say lust, a lot of the times we think of a sexual connotation or anything like that. Look, it could be you're sitting there cultivating unforgiveness in your mind. That person did that to me. I don't need to forgive them. Did you see the way she looked at me? Did you, you heard that? She rolled her eyes at me from across the church. I seen her. She whispered to Matilda. I seen it. Mm -hmm. I don't need to forget her. I know we the body of Christ, but uh, -uh not today. Maybe tomorrow. You know we do that. I'm going to hold that grudge in my heart. He did that. She did that. And you know what? Some of it is just. Some of the stuff we've been through in life, wickedness has gone. I mean, Joseph's brothers threw him in a pit. I mean, they really did that. <laughs> Some people have really hurt us. And it's just. But I think that God was cultivating forgiveness from the moment that Joseph landed in the pit. Because by the time he got to the palace, he was able to forgive his brothers. That's right. When they showed up. Not only able to forgive them, but able to feed them. So God, God had to have done a work in his heart because when they showed up, he didn't say get out. When they showed up, he didn't say behead them. He had all power and authority to do whatever he wanted to do at that time. And listen, body of Christ, we're quick to behead people. We are. We're quick. We're quick when they walk in. Off of their heads. They haven't been doing the right thing. They've been at the altar 30 times for that thing. You see them. You see them down at the altar, man. You see them in the parking lot out there doing X, Y, and Z. I'm, we're doing this production, and we see one of the teenagers that plays one of the main roles in the production rolling down the street listening to some song that was cussing up a storm. And one of the people that were with us, he was like, Hey, you that kid in the production? I said, Yes, he is. He said, did you listen to that song that he was playing out there right here? I said, yes, he, yes, I did. But why don't you pray for him? I said, because maybe he's in the process of changing. And that's just one thing God didn't do yet. That's just one thing that God didn't get to yet. We didn't get here overnight. And if you think you have arrived, go look in the mirror 
again. Because none of us have arrived, and we all fall short of the glory of God. And if you think you have, get ready, because God's about to knock you on your booty. Because that's what he does to show us, oh, you're just like that. You're just like that. You're all, we all in a preparation of the process. And God is getting us ready. God is getting us ready for, for the palace. And in this, is, they say, let us, let us kill him. And I can't imagine the discouragement and the hurt and the rejection that Joseph has went through at this time. Look, and I do want to say this. Right afterwards, it says, and it came to pass that when Joseph come to his brethren, they tried to strip him of his coat of many colors. That word strip means to pull off, to spoil. And they took him and cast him into the pit. I have to say this because it's the job of the enemy to try to strip you of your birthright. Mm -hmm. To pull it off. To get you to believe that it's not true. You're not saved. You see the way you acted? A saved person doesn't act like that. No, but we're in the process, y'all. That's right. We are in a process of change. And as long as we continue to believe, God will continue to change us. That's right. So don't think. Like, I used to believe that a lot. That I, I man, I, I've fallen short. I must not be saved. No, as long as you continue to believe God and trust him and have faith, he will continue to work in your life. And do not judge somebody else's salvation. The Bible says we are to be judges of fruit, yes. But when people ask me, you think they say, I don't know, I'm not the judge. I don't know their heart. Don't ask me, I'm not judging. Now, do they might need prayer? Okay, let's pray for them. Let's stop looking at them crooked. And God said that, they, that the brothers were trying to strip him. Look, be aware. The enemy's trying to strip you of your birthright. And it's your job to protect. <clears throat> protect your birthright. Protect it. And then we see, do you think that Joseph's life after the pit got better? No. No. Do you ever feel that way? Man, this is supposed to get better. Isn't this supposed to get better? It's been a year. Wait, we're going on two here. This is supposed to get better, right, Michelle? It's supposed to get better. Is it supposed to get better, Vince? It's supposed to get better. But God, but Joseph's life kept getting worse. Joseph's life, but you know what I love? The Bible continuously says God was with Joseph. God was with Joseph. But God was with Joseph in the pit. But God was with Joseph when he was sold into slavery. And you know what you see in that? You see a depiction of Jesus when Judas sold him out. So God was allowing Joseph to go through the same trial that he went through himself. And would Joseph continue to believe? God allows us to go through things that happen to him as a man, as Jesus. To see if our faith would be strengthened and built and we would continue to believe. But then not only that, he goes into Potiphar's house and Potiphar's wife comes on to him. Okay, so we see that. It didn't get better after he was sold to the Egyptians. He goes into Potiphar's house, but it said Potiphar seen the anointing of God upon his life. And he, he put him up in second in command in his house. You trust the Lord, God will exalt you. It says, if we, if we humble ourselves before the Lord, he will exalt us in due season. God is going to do it. You just have to believe. You just have to believe. Well, that sounds really simple but hard. You just have to trust. God was with Brennan. God was with Mike. God is with you through every trial. And then it says, it says that he, um, from Potiphar's house, he gets thrown into the prison. So you think, hey, it's going to get better. But it gets worse. How long, oh Lord, will I face this? How long, oh Lord, will I travel through this trial? You exalt me, oh God, in my, you exalt me, oh God, in my trial. You use me, God, 
God in my trial. But then it gets worse. But God was just getting him ready because the blessing that he was about to receive was about to be greater than he could ever imagine. And his heart had to be ready for the blessing. See, God knows what the blessing is in your life. God knows where he has you. God is preparing you for that season. But he's got to do the work and you got to allow the work. We can stop the work. Yes. We can stop the Holy Spirit from doing what he wants to do. That's right. We can choose to go with Potiphar's wife and lie down. Yeah. We can choose to entreat. The tactic and snare of the enemy. And then God, God in his great mercy convicts us and brings us back and washes us clean and dusts us off and puts us back on track. Delay is not denial. That's right. Delay is not denial. But we have to know what God is doing in our lives. And that's our job with the Holy Ghost to know what's going on. Hallelujah. Say no means no. No, no, say it with some authority. No means no. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt to Potiphar's. And also an officer of Pharaoh, a captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him to the hands of the Ishmaelites and brought him down. See, we would look at that and be like, oh my gosh, here's this trial again. But Joseph was being set in position. He had to go to Potiphar's house. To get to the prison, to meet the baker and the butler, to, for them to know that he could interpret dreams, to get him in a pharaoh's house, to be second in command so that he could replenish the storehouse, that his brothers could come back to him and he could save them from the famine and poverty. God wrote all that. He was the author of all that. He knew all that. But, but Joseph did not. All Joseph could see was, I'm in Potiphar's house. All Joseph could see was the trial. And am I going to be advanced in the process or am I going to be ambushed by the enemy? And which way am I going to go? So we see him being set in position. Joseph's faith being tested time and time again was all part of God's plan. God says, I know the thoughts I think towards you, said the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you an expectant end. And the Lord was with Joseph. And he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. He was prosperous in his pain. He was prosperous in preparation. He was prosperous, meaning to push forward. He made it pros profitable. Mm. He didn't allow the trial to break him, mm. but he made a profit out of it. Why? Because God was departing. He was putting stuff in him that he needed to go into the palace. He was positioning him for the palace. He was prosperous and all that he did. And I said, the Lord, the covenant-keeping God, was with Joseph. God does not break his agreement. He doesn't break his covenant with you. Right. This is who he is, and he will not change. Right. And he has all these promises for you. That's his covenant with you. And it is not broken because of the blood of Jesus. So the covenant-keeping God is always with you. No matter what you walk through. And he's trying to advance you and prosper your soul. And he said the master saw that the Lord was with him. And the Lord made all that he did prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in the sight. And he did what? Served him. Oh God help us to be servants. God help us to serve one another. God, help us to serve the body of Christ. God, help us to serve the broken heart. God, help us to serve that drunk that walks in. God, help us to serve the homeless. God, help us to serve the pastor. Y'all, Pastor Matt undergoes a lot of pressure when you deal with the church. He is your servant, but we are to serve him. Do we know how to serve? 
Jesus came to not be a king, but to serve. And it said, Joseph, even being in this place of Potiphar, who was a, a captain of the Egyptian of the guard, learned how to serve. Do we know how to serve that boss we don't like? Do we know how to serve, like I can even say, in marriage? When we don't agree with our spouse? We don't do that, do we? <laughs> <laughs> do we know how to serve our children? Do we do we know how to serve someone when they're being nasty to us? Because it does say that love covers. That's right. Do we know how to serve when we don't agree with that person being put in that position? Do we know how to serve? It said Joseph served him, and in his service. He made him overseer of the house. Why? Because of Joseph's humility. Yeah. And all that he had put into his hand. The result of God being with Joseph was Joseph was exalted no matter where he went. And it came to pass from time to time that he made him overseer of the house and overseer of all that he had. And the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house. When you are where God wants you to be, the blessings of God overflow from your life. You should be an overflow of God's presence. You should be an overflow of God's love. You should be an overflow of God's peace. We should be an overflow of God's joy. We should be an overflow. So wherever we go, God will bless that because the spirit of God is in you. So God blesses the Egyptian's house for what Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had and all that was in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hands and he knew not what he had, save the bread that he did eat. And Joseph was what? A goodly person and well favored. That means that Joseph was attractive. So Joseph was an attractive man and pleasant to the eyes. And he was advancing in God's kingdom. When God does a work in you, it's attractive. It's attractive to the Lord. He delights in the work that he does in you. It says it's a sweet smell, a, a fragrance, an aroma. It's attractive to, to the, those that are around because there's a fragrance that comes off of your life because the work that God is doing. Look, even when you mess up, if you go and make things, I'll give you this example. When my husband and I fight and he comes back and says he's sorry, there's a fragrance. No, honestly, though, there's a fragrance that comes along with that. There's a like, oh, I want to submit. Oh, I want to come under. Oh, I want to love. Oh, I, when you apologize to your children, guess what? They get to see what living the Christian life looks like. They get to smell the fragrance of forgiveness of Christ. You hear what I'm saying? When, when, when we become transparent and allow the, the Lord to do a work, there's an attraction that comes. The world doesn't understand why you're so loving, why you're so kind, why are you joyful in this circumstance. The world doesn't understand it. But there's an attraction that comes along with it because it's Jesus. Because it's Jesus. This one lady told me in the gym, she said, I've had trainers before, but you're just different. I said, it's just Jesus. It really is. I mean, it's Jesus. It's just Jesus. Because there's a work he is doing. She said, you're always pleasant. I'm like, you should be at home with me. <laughs> God's doing the work at home, and then I go to the gym, and then it overflows. Amen. I meant you're pleasant at home. <laughs> But when God begins to advance you in your heart, there's the ambush of the enemy mm, yep. that's lying in wait to dismantle what God has done. That's it. So when you have come to this altar and you feel the freedom mm. of God come in your heart, Hallelujah. be on guard. Hallelujah. 
Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, is a, is a roaring lion walking about, seeking whom he may devour. That means completely gulp down. When you feel that word of freedom come, you feel that healing come, you feel that restoration between you and God come, when you feel that forgiveness break through in your heart and you're going to let it go, guess what? That same situation is about to pop up because God is going to test it. And the enemy is going to try to ambush you with it. He said, Beloved, think it not strange when you, when you fall into these fiery trials. Which come to try you. As though some strange thing has come upon you. Church, get ready. It's time to not be intoxicated. And what I mean by that is when you drink, right, you get intoxicated. You can't understand. You can't see clear. Your, your, your perception is off. Well, that can happen in life. We become confused. We become, we become so consumed with the trial that we become intoxicated with it and we can't see clear. Or, or, or we go and we run to other things that take our attention and take our mind and take our heart and all of a sudden we become intoxicated and captivated with other things and we're not focused on the Lord and, we're, and, and all of a sudden the enemy comes and ambushes and knocks us off our feet because we weren't ready. We, we weren't awake. We weren't being sober-minded. We weren't acknowledging the Lord in all things and letting him direct our path. We weren't staying, staying anchored and steady and still. We're floating all over the place. Our faith is tossed to and fro. But you know what? Joseph was ready. He was like, I know what the master has given me. And I, I know what he's committed into my hands. I know that he's given his son for me. And I know that that, that price was not cheap. I know that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for my life was not cheap. So I am going to stand fast and I'm going to be sober and I'm going to be vigilant and I'm going to be awake and I'm going to be aware and I'm going to be ready and I'm going to be in my word and I'm going to be in his presence and I'm going to be in prayer because I'm going to be ready when this ambush takes place. Hallelujah. I'm going to be ready when the enemy is lurking, even in my family, Amen. overseer of the house, watch your life. Watch your husband. Watch your children. Watch your best friend. Now it always says to me, I'm a grown woman. I said, I know, but I love you. I'm be your best friend. And I'm not going to be quiet. So what's this? She said, Angela, you always ask me a million questions. I said, that's because I love you. And I want to know what's going on. Overseer, and then she come ask me a million questions. And I don't think I tell you I'm a grown woman. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, is we are to be watchmen. We're to be overseers. You're to be your brother's keeper. My mom said to me this morning, "Where, where's everybody at?" I said, "I don't know. I'm not my brother's keeper." I'm just playing, though. But honestly, we're to be our brother's keeper. Come on. Amen. Yeah. Look, you aren't to put everybody's business out there, but if you see something, guess what? Right, right. Go to that person. Say, hey, I see you're really down today. I see, are you okay? Can I pray with you? Can I do something for you? How can I serve you? How can I be there for you? Mm. Is there something you need? You need me to come over? You need me? What, what, what do you need me to do for you? How can even Pastor Matt, y'all? Yeah. Go to Pastor Matt. Is there anything I can do for you? Can I serve you? Can I be there for you? How can I pray for you and your family? How can I? We're to be overseers of what God has committed into our hands. Amen. Same thing with your boss. How can I go the extra mile? What can I do for you? Can I help you with anything? Your spouse, same thing with your spouse. What can I do for you? I know I'm real good at that, right? <laughs> what can I do 
do for you? How can I help you? Your children. Can I pray for you? Your children need prayer. Right. Don't forget about them. That's right. They are little people, but they are smart. They are smart little people. Listen, they know way more than you think they do. I mean, Ezra and McCartney and Asher, they, I mean, they know. They know. They know what's going on. They are not stupid. So we better train, train those children up in the way that should, they should go. We better impart the word of God into their lives. We better teach them the difference between the voice of God and the ambush of the enemy. We better tell them how to live when trials come. We need to teach them. If you don't have children yet, guess what? Teach these children. Teach, teach whoever you can teach. Be an overseer. Teach your friends. Teach your family. Be an overseer of what God has placed and committed into your hands. And it said that in the midst of God, in the midst of Joseph, now being content with where God had put him, being in position, here comes Potiphar's wife. And it came to pass after these things that the master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. The lust of the eyes. Y'all ever hear lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh? Pride of life? Sometimes God and the enemy, the enemy will use our eyes to catch our attention. And she didn't recognize, oh wait, I'm not supposed to be looking at that, that way. So all of a sudden, the enemy sets up Joseph, and Joseph did what? Refused. I want to encourage you this morning. I don't know what the enemy has been bringing your way, but I want to encourage you to run like Joseph ran. I want to encourage you this morning to refuse, decline, reject, and disapprove of the advances of the enemy this morning. And what he said unto his master's wife, he spoke to that thing. And he said, my master has committed his whole life into my hands. And I refuse and I decline by the blood of Jesus Christ to go in the direction that you are encouraging me to go. Because I know that it is the wrong direction. And you want to know what I love about Joseph? If Joseph took off, he left everything behind, his coat and everything. He said, I'm out of here. I don't want nothing to do with this direction. I don't want anything to do with that lifestyle. I have been committed to my God. I will not sin against him. And I will go the way that he has chose for me to go. I will not. I refuse. Amen. Now if you would come up. And it came to pass. As she spoke to Joseph day by day. He hearkened not unto her. The enemy is going to try to get you to quit. He's going to try to get you to believe, to go backwards, to doubt, to come under the suggestions of the enemy. But let's look at the life of Jesus. Jesus, being tempted by Satan in the wilderness, said this. Again, the devil take him up on exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And said unto him, all these things I will give unto you if you will fall down and worship me. The devil is saying that to us. He's saying, all these things I will give you if you would worship me. The enemy wants you to worship him and not to worship God. He wants you to submit to him and not to worship God. But what did Jesus say? Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall I serve. Him only shall I serve. We should take the, the response of Joseph and the response of Jesus and say, I'm not, I'm not going the way of the enemy. I choose this day who I will worship. I choose this day who I will serve. I'm not going to serve blame. I'm not going to serve guilt. I'm not going to serve unforgiveness. I'm not going to serve um, bondage or sin. I'm not going to serve lust or my own desires or my own direction. I will choose this day to serve Jesus. 
Jesus. Jesus and him alone and everything his word says to be true, I will take it and I will believe it and I will stand on it. And it will be an anchor for my soul that I don't waver to and fro. And I will resist the plan of the enemy. Submit to God and the enemy will flee. And I believe that's what the Lord, if you would stand with me this morning, I believe that's what the Lord wants to do in our hearts this morning, that there would be a surrender, that there would be a submission, that there would be a moment. We've been through trials. We've been through circumstances. Oh, the enemy has come to take us and ambush us and rob and kill and destroy the birthright that you have in Jesus, to strip you of what you have in him. But we refuse. We refuse. We decline. We disapprove of the enemy right now and his tactics and his schemes, oh God. And we pick up the word of God and we fight with the sword of the spirit. And we believe you, oh God. We believe you, Jesus, that you're going to take us from the pit and place us in the palace. And you're going to prepare us in the way. God, so help, help us to remember that no means no. God, that no means no, Lord Jesus. God, I pray, continue to do in our hearts what you want us to do. If you just want to be encouraged this morning and let the Lord wash over you in your trial and restore you to him this morning, I encourage you to come to the altar. Let him refer.